You dare fight me? It's a futuristic ninja battle against wonky physics in NES Works episode 134. We've seen some excellent direct adaptations of arcade games to NES over the years, and we've seen some great reinventions of coin-op titles for the console. Strider for NES is neither. It's an interesting game, and sometimes it's even kind of good. But it suffers from some absolutely stunning technical errors, a lot of which appear to be own goals, and it falls far short of the quality of work NES fans had come to associate with Capcom. I mean, sure, Strider had come out in Capcom's early NES days of Micronics programmed arcade ports, it would have felt perfectly in keeping with the rest of the lineup. But Capcom advertised this game in magazines alongside Mega Man 2, suggesting a certain design quality and technical expertise that you won't find here. Everyone has their off days, but how did Capcom manage to miss the mark this badly? Especially when Strider shares a name, and at least a superficial amount of content, with hands down the coolest arcade release of 1989. To really understand what happened with Strider, we need to cast our minds back from 1989 to the beginning of the decade, back to the early days of console games. More specifically, back to the early days of the Reagan administration in the US. Ronald Reagan assumed the American presidency in January 1981, the orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution. And as soon as he took office, he and his team immediately began to undertake a series of sweeping deregulations that stripped away decades of consumer and citizen protections in favor of greater freedom and power for the wealthy and the corporations. That's a whole other topic for a whole different retrospective series. But that deregulatory era did impact video gaming in a few different ways, including one that indirectly paved the way for the mess that is Strider. Perhaps inevitably, given his own background as an actor, one of Reagan's first major deregulatory acts affected television. His newly appointed head of the Federal Trade Commission, James Clifford Miller III, discarded years of expert testimony, professional studies, and concerns by parents, striking down limitations on advertising to children on TV. The Bleeding Heart's 60s and 70s had produced reams of evidence that young children lack the critical capacity to recognize the difference between programmed television content and advertisements leaving them susceptible to commercials targeted directly toward them. A responsible society, the popular opinion reasoned, would therefore enact laws to prevent corporations from pushing goods on children. Commercial entities disagree, feeling they should have the right to hawk their wares to anyone, even people too young for their brains to have fully developed the ability to separate fact from fiction. Miller agreed, a fact that surely had nothing to do with the millions of dollars that corporate lobbyists waved in his direction. He struck down incipient regulations on youth-targeted ads, opening the door for a smorgasbord of ads fine-tuned for kids. It didn't take long for toy makers to see the potential here. They suddenly had more profound opportunities for peddling their wares to kids than simply introducing their products as the brought-to-you-by-sponsors-for-TV shows. In no time at all, they began to transform, literally, their products into the shows themselves. Hasbro fired off the first major salvo of this new trend as part of its relaunch of the G.I. Joe toy line in 1982. G.I. Joe had made its debut in the 1960s as basically a version of Barbie for boys, that is, sporting guns and Apollo capsules instead of purses and dream houses. But the line had declined in popularity over the course of the 1970s as American sentiment soured on the appeal of war making in the wake of the Vietnam debacle. The 12-inch G.I. Joe line also found itself hamstrung by the same OPEC price-fixing that nearly wiped out Nintendo in the 1970s by causing the cost of production for petroleum-based plastics to skyrocket. But emboldened by the surging patriotic fervor of the new Reagan era, Hasbro relaunched G.I. Joe in 82 in a much smaller 4-inch form that used less plastic, inspired as it was by Kenner's minuscule Star Wars figures though this line retained most of the articulation and detail that had defined G.I. Joe's older 12-inch dolls. I mean, action figures. Star Wars didn't just inspire the form of G.I. Joe figures, it also inspired the way Hasbro would sell the line. Star Wars had been an unexpected hit for director George Lucas back in 1977. Its various comic book tie-ins and novelizations had been massively popular, keeping the Star Wars universe alive for kids long after they'd returned home from the theater in an age before accessible home video. What really sealed the deal, however, were the toy tie-ins. 
Star Wars action figures eclipsed the sales of any previous boys' toy line, such as Mego's Star Trek and Marvel Comics dolls. Lucas made a ton of money from the films, but he raked in even vaster sums from the toys, thanks to his unbelievably canny decision to retain the movie's licensing rights. The rest of the media and toy world sat up, took notice, and immediately attempted, almost invariably without success, to duplicate Lucas's accomplishment. Hasbro, however, decided to take a slightly different tack with G.I. Joe. Rather than create toy lines and comics to bite off the success of a film, they built a TV show and comic to promote the toy line. Hasbro recruited Marvel, whose 1970s financial struggles had been erased by the success of their licensed Star Wars comics, to create both a G.I. Joe comic book and, through its newly minted Sunbow animation division, a syndicated cartoon that would air on weekday afternoons right around the time kids returned home from school and switched on their televisions. While the comic and cartoon existed independently, telling distinct original stories about the characters and vehicles from the toy line, Hasbro linked the two formats with a succession of commercials for the comic, animated in the style of the cartoon, which dramatized the event of an upcoming issue, and which naturally featured cool illustrations of elements from the toy line front and center. To call this approach a success would be an understatement. The cartoon ran for several seasons. The toy line's popularity eclipsed that of the record-setting Star Wars figures by 1984, and the comic actually became the single best-selling comic book in the world for a little while. Which brings us in a roundabout way to Strider. Look at that guy go, isn't he so cool? See, around the time that G.I. Joe burst onto the scene, so did video games. Or rather, so did video games with distinguishable characters driven by story-like premises, rather than stick figures motivated by scoring instructions. Every hit character-based video game of the early 80s seemingly launched its own kids-oriented commercial in the form of a Saturday morning cartoon, from obvious favorites like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong to more unlikely efforts like Pole Position. The age of multimedia adaptations had kicked into full gear in the US, and this sea change didn't go unnoticed in Japan. As American kids withered under an onslaught of targeted advertising that would cause young Gen Xers like me and the millennials who followed to imprint on toy and video game brands like they were our own parents, Japan's youth experienced something similar, albeit in a more organic fashion. Media and toy synergy had thrived in post-war Japan. Godzilla toys actually factor into the plot of All Monsters Attack, a Godzilla movie. But that synergy leveled up around the same time that Reagan paved the way for that transformation in the U.S. mediascape. In February 1981, Tokyo's Shinjuku area hosted an event called The Declaration of a New Anime Century, a promotional event for the first movie based on the mobile suit Gundam TV series. In its original 1979 TV run, Gundam had fared so poorly in the ratings that the network had cancelled it before its storyline ended. But, not unlike Star Trek in the West, Gundam resonated with a dedicated core of viewers who found themselves drawn to its sustained narrative and comparatively complex themes and morality. This grassroots support culminated in a theatrical release for the series, condensed into a trilogy of movies with new material intercut into the existing content. The new Anime Century event had been planned as a modest press event for a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand fans. When the time came, more than 20,000 teenagers ended up descending on Shinjuku. Not unlike Star Wars, Gundam's breakout success didn't simply launch a massive franchise of books, comics, cartoons, and more toys than you could begin to count. It also inspired countless imitators who attempted to recreate the alchemy of this cross-format success. Shows like Super Dimension Fortress Macross and Red Spot Zillion carefully replicated Gundam's space opera narrative formula while aggressively foregrounding related toy lines. Naturally, video game adaptations of these properties followed in due time. Before long, Japanese kids began seeing their own homegrown attempts at recreating the setup Hasbro and Marvel had invented for G.I. Joe, a scheme that had a natural avenue into Japan through the reverse-imported Transformers line. Transformers had begun in Japan as the Diaclone toy line adjacent to the Microman toy line that helped inspire the new G.I. Joe figure body. When Hasbro licensed Diaclone, they combined it with toys from several unrelated transforming robot lines and tapped Marvel and Sunbow again to rework that disparate line into a G.I. Joe adjacent multi-pronged youth onslaught, which Takara then relocalized back into Japan to great success. This would be followed by the likes of the Zillion Light Gun and Muscle, a line of collectible figurines based on Yude Tamago's Kinikuman manga, which took on a life of its own in animation and toy form. 
Naturally, the booming Famicom market provided an obvious opportunity for additional marketing. Licensed games had been a given since the Atari 2600 and Bandai Arcadia. The Famicom hosted games based on toys, movies, cartoons, novels, comics, even pop stars, all hoping to kite off the popularity of an existing property with a video game cash-in. And Famicom games, in turn, inspired media tie-ins. A Super Mario Bros. strategy guide topped the charts in book form and inspired toys, manga, and a direct-to-consumer video, and paved the way directly for Nintendo Power as it happens. Adventure Island inspired a cartoon, and so on and so forth. And then in 1989, Capcom finally dared to ask, what if we did all of this at once by creating a multi-format property built around a video game as its centerpiece? A G.I. Joe, but planned in advance to be based around a video game rather than a toy. And so this long, shaggy tale of deregulation and multimedia ambition brings us to Strider, the NES's first attempt at a multi-threaded smash hit property with a video game at the center of its web. It was an interesting and groundbreaking idea, and ultimately a bit of a disaster. Strider ended up consisting of three media properties. First, you have a prelude manga, which debuted in May 1988 by a Katakawa Shoten, in order to set the stage for the upcoming game releases. Next came an arcade title, which made its debut in early 1989. And finally, you have the NES game, which shipped in July 1989 and ostensibly tied everything together. Well, that appears to have been the plan anyway. If everything had gone as intended, Strider would have been a smash hit in Japan and abroad, a property that fired on all cylinders and demonstrated the potential of a carefully cultivated media franchise built around video games. Needless to say, everything did not go as intended. Strider did give us a very cool futuristic ninja protagonist, Hiryu, and a dazzling piece of quarter-gobbling arcade excitement. But that's about it. Capcom's multimedia ambitions for the property never really went anywhere. It took a decade before we even saw a proper game sequel. Let's ignore Journey into Darkness for a moment. And that in turn only really happened because of Hiryu's popularity in Marvel vs. Capcom. Yes, Marvel again. They seem to have their fingerprints all over this thing. By all standards, Strider should have been a smash hit. The arcade game was, again, so damn cool. Hiryu used his plasma sword Cypher to slash his way through five stages of pure cinematic action, assassinating the Soviet Politburo, actually a robotic centipede somehow, before escaping Eurasia alive by way of a Siberian power installation where he boarded a futuristic aerial warship belonging to the evil Grandmaster Mayo. From there, he ventured to the Amazon to investigate the whereabouts of Mayo, which turned out to be an artificial satellite called the Third Moon. Battling through the space station, Yuryu eventually defeated Mayo and returned to Earth to ride around on dolphins. This game pushed the limits of Capcom's CPS-1 board, and its best-selling port to Sega Genesis taxed that console's capabilities in turn. It would have been a tall order for the NES game to pull off a convincing port, but if any developer could have done it, it would have been the company that had just unleashed the spectacular Mega Man 2 into the world. Ah, uh, but that developer Capcom had long since abandoned direct arcade ports. Once they took their arcade to NES conversions in-house, wresting them away from Micronix, Capcom had steadily moved away from direct adaptations in favor of dramatic overhauls, or even sequels. Section Z and Bionic Commando looked and generally played like their arcade counterparts on NES, but those carts effectively amounted to different games entirely. Even vertical shooter Gunsmoke became more of an adventure on NES, incorporating an economy and an element of exploration in order to locate the identity of each gang's boss. So it probably should come as no surprise that Strider for NES superficially resembles the arcade game. It's about a cool-looking ninja with an energy sword who begins his adventure in a futuristic version of Soviet Kazakh, but it differs radically from the more familiar arcade release. It has almost nothing else in common with the coin-op title. Once you fight your way past the first few screens, the NES cart turns out to offer a wholly different experience in every respect. For starters, Arcade Hiryu had a graceful somersaulting jump and could cling to and scale walls. NES Hiryu has a sort of floaty, rigid jump and can only kick off from walls to add height to his leap. Arcade Hiryu could collect icons that increased the length and power of his sword, or provide reinforcements in the form of robot companions. NES Hiryu can't do any of this, but instead learns combat techniques that allow him to fire plasma beams or heal injuries. And most of all, Arcade Hiryu made a mad dash through five stages of cool, high-intensity action set pieces, challenging the player to remain always on the move. Ineos Hiryu explores different areas around the world, taking his journey slowly, 
and frequently returning to earlier areas as he gains new access codes and keys. It is, for all intents and purposes, a completely different work than the arcade release. And little surprise, Capcom assigned two different teams to the Strider project, each working simultaneously and independently. After the initial planning process, in which Capcom staff consulted with manga collective Motokikaku to define the hero's look and setting, coin-op designer Koichi Yotsui has said that the arcade and NES teams had almost nothing to do with each other. His team, a group of seasoned CPS veterans, including Ghost and Goblins designer Tokoro Fujiwara, created the most stylish arcade platformer imaginable. Yotsui's game saw you outracing an explosive hillside minefield one moment before fighting a giant boxing robotic gorilla the next. It gave you no room to breathe, flinging unique enemies and scenarios at you in rapid succession, giving you a liberating sense of acrobatic agility, and even sometimes sending you into zero gravity. The NES team took a wildly different approach. Headed up by designer Masayoshi Kurokawa, they created a plotting take on the Metroidvania formula, plot-driven exploratory adventure. That in itself is no bad thing. Bionic Commando had evolved from a fairly loose and unpolished linear-ish arcade game to a tight, plot-driven platform adventure when it came to NES, a change that simply served to make it into a masterpiece. Strider, unfortunately, doesn't fare nearly so well. You can see some good ideas lurking beneath the surface, they struggle to emerge, drowned by questionable design choices and possibly the most technically challenged programming ever to issue forth from Capcom's internal studios. That seems especially damning when you're talking about the counterpart to something as technically superlative as the coin-op Strider and the shelf companion to Mega Man 2. The Strider arcade game moved quickly and fluidly, and it gave players a profound sense of power as they slashed their way through scores of robots, strongmen, Chinese acrobats, and mechanical dinosaurs. On NES, Hiryu can do far less than his arcade self to begin with, and the things he actually can do feel like a struggle to execute more often than not. Displaced Gamers has delved into Strider's programming issues in exhaustive detail, if you're curious about the whys and wherefores. But in action, these flaws add up to a game that can be downright maddening to play. Strider contains odd collision glitches and annoying knockback quirks, and these make the basic act of running around and fighting into something of a lottery. Will you successfully kill a foe, or will the game fail to register your attack and count an action as damage against Hiryu? potentially sending him flying in the opposite direction as he flutters around under the bizarre falling physics. It's the act of jumping that really bedevils this game. As a platformer, Strider hinges on Hiryu's ability to leap confidently in order to evade hazards and reach higher ground. But this Hiryu has a lot of trouble with being airborne. His feet get tangled up when he jumps from uneven ground, his head collides with invisible barriers, and traveling between moving platforms requires prayer and a healthy supply of patience. And when it comes to the game's trademark move, the wall jump, well, all bets are off. Hiryu doesn't interact with walls the way his fellow ninja Ryu Hayabusa did in Ninja Gaiden. Rather than clinging to walls and biding his time for a reverse leap to a higher space, Hiryu can only kick jump away from walls while in motion, leap toward a wall, make contact, and immediately jump away in the opposite direction. In theory, you should be able to use this ability to ascend narrow vertical passages, leaping back and forth between surfaces and steadily making your way upward. In practice, no, you really can't. Strider's shaky collision and jump programming makes the triangle jump, a core mechanic of the game, utterly infuriating, a process of trial and error that will leave you pulling out your hair in rage. About the only good thing I can say for the triangle jump is that the game's boss encounters are so mundane and unambitious that you never have to perform triangle jumps in order to beat them. One can only imagine how frustrating a game that would have made for them. Still, the cumbersome awkwardness that surrounds this fundamental game mechanic doesn't just compare poorly to the nimble athleticism of Hiryu's arcade self, it diminishes the entire game. A fact attested to by none other than Nintendo Power. The November-December 1989 issue of Nintendo Power dedicates an entire page of the magazine to tips and tricks for Strider. The telling part comes in the Cheats and Secrets code section, Classified Information. The magazine's cheat for Strider consists of a basic explanation of the wall jump. Again, a basic game mechanic. I don't know how to say this, but when performing a fundamental move required to advance in the game becomes so opaque and difficult to perform that simply understanding it amounts to a secret advantage over other players, you've messed up. Up until this point, the magazine's Strider coverage had been fairly innocuous. 
standard fare for a B-tier NES game from a major publisher. Strider first appeared in the March-April 1989 issue by way of a mention in the magazine's Consumer Electronics show coverage. That same issue included a three-page preview on the game, offering a general overview of its premise and mechanics. And, just in time for the game's launch, the July-August issue dedicated another six pages to Strider, taking players through Stage 4 such as it is. What the magazine coverage doesn't really make clear is just how much backtracking Strider requires. For example, Stage 1, Kazakh SSR, contains several sections that you can't access until later in the game, blocked off by doors corresponding to numbered keys. One of these keys lies hidden inside an Egyptian pyramid, so Nintendo Power presents Egypt as Stage 2, then lists the passage you can access in Kazakh as Stage 3. This isn't really accurate, nor is it how the game unfolds in practice. When you unlock Egypt, you also gain access to Australia at the same time, but most of Australia is locked behind a high-level door, so you can't do anything meaningful there until you've located that key, late in the game. Strider involves a moderate amount of discovery and environmental puzzle solving. Admittedly, it doesn't begin to compare with, say, Legacy of the Wizard, and on top of that, the frustratingly clumsy quality of the game's control can sometimes lead you to believe that you've reached a dead end when in fact you have the tools and skills to advance once the programming code decides to cooperate with you. Still, there is a certain charm to the way the NES plot unfolds as a sort of investigation, with Hiryu's moment-to-moment -moment motivation generally amounting to a search for clues and tools and leads. As long as you don't look too critically at the game flow, which is far more linear than the presentation would have you believe, it does feel like a bit of an adventure. Admittedly, it won't win any awards for narrative coherence. The in-game dialogue has the terse, non-sequitur quality that you get from first draft translations. Worse, it introduces characters and terms as if the player should be intimately familiar with them, which in fact was the operating assumption behind this version of Strider. Unlike the arcade game, which presented a sort of pantomime action movie as Hiryu moved against the ambitions of the Palpatine-like Grandmaster Mayo, Strider on NES takes a more involved approach with character dialogue throughout the adventure. It also presents Hiryu as a member of a group of warriors, the eponymous Striders, with a hierarchy and character histories. Hiryu also refers to friends and even family members at times. This all makes a lot more sense when you remember the Strider manga serial that published in Japan as a lead-in to the games. The arcade game had nothing of note in common with the manga outside of the lead character, but the NES game directly adapts the manga storyline into video game form. All the characters mentioned in passing here, Kane, Matic, Sheena, and even some minor military officers showed up in the manga first. The manga led directly to the NES game, and the NES game takes it as a given that players will have read the manga. There's only one problem with this, which is that the manga and game audiences had zero overlap. Kadokawa never localized the Strider manga into English for America, and Capcom never published the NES game in Japan. Both prongs of this multimedia onslaught existed in isolation, connected only by an arcade game that had nothing much to do with either of them. Capcom had bold, admirable ambitions with this franchise, but those dreams withered on the vine due to, well, who knows why. You'd think the NES game would have at least made its way to Famicom. If nothing else, it might have given the dev team a chance to polish up the flaws in the game and make Strider as fun to play on console as in arcades. But no, Strider ended up shipping exclusively in the US, making it one of those enticing lost Capcom Famicom releases that would vex fans, like Black Tiger. As for the manga, well, I can sort of understand why it didn't come here. Manga in America was still very much in its early days as of 1989. Aside from Viz Comics' early efforts with adult-oriented fare like Golgo 13, Fist of the North Star, and Nausicaa, the only other American publishers of note dealing in manga were Eclipse Comics and Epic Comics. Epic was a Marvel Comics imprint, yes, those freaking guys again, and they had so little confidence that American audiences would respond well to the absolute medium-defining masterpiece that was Akira that they flipped and colorized the damn thing for the US. So the Strider manga would have struggled to find much reach here. The art and composition felt profoundly dated, even in Japan. Motokikaku worked in a decidedly old-school Showa style, reminiscent of 1970s comics like Cyborg 009 and Galaxy Express 39. Although that look wasn't entirely out of the question for localization, Eclipse had helped kick off American manga with the Showa as Hell Area 88, 
The truth is that the Strider manga lacks the quality and dynamism of a Shotaro Ishinomori or Leiji Matsumoto book. As it happens, someone finally scanslated the final chapters of the Strider manga into English just last year, so you can easily find it and read it online for yourself. It's about 35 years too late to help the NES game, but at least you can finally see who the hell Sheena was, besides a cool looking machine gun lady who appears in the opening demo of the NES game and nowhere else. It's possible that the shared rights to the character, who appears to exist in a sort of joint custody arrangement between Capcom and Moto Kikaku, tangled things up. Considering the popularity of Strider in arcades, the character vanishing for nearly a decade seemed strange, and when he did reappear, thanks again, Marvel, a copyright credit for Moto Kikaku now accompanied him. Who knows? Whatever the case, Capcom failed to make a crucial connection for Strider in two regions, derailing what may well have been the world's first ever attempt at creating an international multimedia franchise anchored by a video game. Well, at least we did get a sweet as hell arcade game. And the NES cartridge still has a certain raw charm to it. The physics and dialogue are awful, but it captures that compelling sense of discovery and uncertainty that you get in the early proto-Metroidvania adventures of the 8-bit era. The globetrotting premise gives each area of Strider's world its own unique vibe, from the spiky death traps of the Egyptian pyramid, to Japan's techno dojo, to the murky ambushes of Africa's robotic jungle. Admittedly, it's a little weird that Australia and Africa are connected by a short pneumatic tube like banks used to send cash capsules at drive through tellers, but it's a video game, it's fine. And if the storyline doesn't make a lot of sense, something to do with mind control machines made in the image of the Norse Yggdrasil world tree, and the plot is yet another your boss is actually the bad guy twist that was already becoming a tire trip on the NES, the overall structure of a futuristic investigation based around a space station in the shape of a giant dragon is wacky enough to work. I feel like there's a great game here, desperately struggling and failing to chisel its way out of a prison of mediocrity. Controls worked better, and the majority of bosses weren't just Yggdrasil machines that sit there passively while you slice them to pieces. It could work. If Hiryu had a more interesting power upgrade path than learning special skills that go largely ignored in favor of saving your tech points for healing, it could be good. If the story made more effort to stand alone, and the item drops were better balanced, and you didn't constantly glitch through objects and find thin air impassable, Strider could be a classic. None of these things are true though, which is a shame. Still, I'm not the only one to have seen the potential here. When Capcom attempted to bring back the Strider franchise 10 years ago as a downloadable release for last-gen consoles, that open-ended, exploratory, double-helix-developed adventure took its cues from the NES game. A quarter century is a long time to wait for redemption and vindication. But you know, there's enough to like about Strider for NES that it was worth waiting for someone to winnow out all the crap. Anyway, the long and short of it is, you can blame Reagan for the mess that is Strider for NES and the fact that a Japanese publisher dumped this lousy release onto Americans exclusively. But that's okay, we'd get our revenge soon enough. Next time on NES Works, it's ya bo- I mean, ya boy- Nobunaga.